Well, we've got another episode with a lot of emotional charge. This is episode 83 on the Air Hug Community Podcast. Hello there and welcome or welcome back. If you are new here, this is the Air Hug Community Podcast, and I am your host, Judy Arizoza. I am a midlife lady who is someone who loves to share stories from myself and special guests that reflect on just how midlife really goes, not how we think it should go. We talk about the good, the bad, the messy, the ugly, the wonderful, all the emotions. And this is a place where we actually can grow from our experiences. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. Let's get started. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Air Hug Community Podcast. We have a very special guest today, and I'm laughing because you know all our guests are special, but actually... When I brought Michelle on and I said I was so excited, I'm like, oh, am I allowed to be excited about this topic? And Michelle has a very unique um, niche of area that she serves. And she works with grieving families specifically, right, Michelle, the how to deal or how siblings and families deal with the grief when a child has been lost. So Michelle, I'm going to have you hop right in, but I just want to say that I have been wanting to talk for the longest time and to find someone knowledgeable on on the survivors of, of when a family loses a child, both the siblings, the parents, the whole extended family. And I feel like when we got connected, I was like, my prayers were answered because Mm -hmm. I have known probably what I consider more than my fair share of parents who have lost children. And it's, it touches my heart and it's a way I just didn't know how. And so you are like a guardian angel that has showed up in my life, in our life here on the air hug community. So Michelle, tell us your story. Well, thank you, Judy. I I'm glad to be here because this, this really is a tough topic that touches more people than we realize. And that is child loss and, um, child loss is hard, no matter when it happens, uh, whether it's a grown child or a young child, my specific area of focus is on young families that have lost a child when they've kind of got their whole future ahead of them and all of these dreams and suddenly those dreams are shattered because a child who's supposed to be growing up and fulfilling promises and potential is no longer there and particularly uh, how does that impact a sibling who then grows up without their sibling and I came into this um from my own experience, I was an early childhood parent educator here in Minnesota. We have an early childhood program in every school district for families of preschool age children uh, and their parents. And I was the one that worked with the parents. And so I had my master's in family education. I was raising my own two young children. This was the perfect job for me. I got to talk about the challenges and joys of raising young children. But then my son was four and a half and my daughter was 15 months old and he was diagnosed with cancer. And we experienced grief in our family because of the loss of that innocent childhood, first of all, and all of the changes and compromises our family had to go through uh, because during his two and a half year journey with uh, cancer, my daughter was 15 months old when her brother was diagnosed. So she went through her quote unquote, terrible twos and threes at a time when, um, when we were very focused on her brother's health issues. And it was interesting to see how she did that. It was very informing for me Um, as an early childhood educator to see how she navigated all of this. And then she was three and a half when her brother died. And she said to me, mommy, half of me is gone. So I was faced with the unthinkable role of 
grieving my son and parenting my young daughter who said half of me is gone and yet had her whole life ahead of her. So this is where my heart is. Very few children her age would have articulated that, mm -hmm. but the fact that she did just, and me being an early childhood parent educator just really brought those unique needs of these young bereaved siblings front and center. And I didn't know anything about grief. I hadn't lost, uh, I had lost my grandmother. I had lost people that you expect to lose. I hadn't experienced any grief that really, um, you know, took me off my stride the way that this did just really devastated me the way that this did. So I had a lot of learning to do. I thought I could probably find resources because I was in this early childhood space. I should say that this was my son died 20 years ago. He died in 2000. Um, and there were there weren't Facebook groups to talk to other parents. There weren't and there were not resources. There were not people helping me with this. And so now I am here sharing the things that I learned over my uh, 20 year journey and am still learning. And my little three and a half year old is now 25 months or 25 years. <laughs> and um, so this is my heart. And um, one thing that I learned, you mentioned that, you know, that, you know, adults who have lost children, and my focus was on the sibling because people don't see the sibling, they see the parent that's devastated by child mm -hmm. loss. And they yeah. say, and it's called the worst loss for a reason. But there's this little one there who is, uh, you know, lost part of her identity. And um, that's who I want to help. But I can't do it without first helping the parents um, to really see their grief and navigate their own grief. So this is the work I do with good grief parenting. Goodness gracious. And you had to navigate this yourself. Literally, you were, I hate to say blazing a trail, but. Mm -hmm. But I from, was blazing a trail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you were, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know if you knew anyone that came before you like that. But being that you had that background in early education, you know, in that your daughter was so um, able to communicate. Yeah. What a profound statement for a three and a half year old. Yes. And when you say blazing a trail, the reason I say, yes, I'm blazing a trail is because if we rely as adults on what we learned in childhood, we're going to, most of us are going to go off into the weeds because what we learned in childhood, what I learned, I didn't have parents who, who helped me learn as a child, how to grieve well, how to talk about my grief and be comforted and cared for in my grief and learn that I could build resilience and go forward from mm -hmm. there, that this is a part of life and I will still be okay. I didn't have adults helping me with that. So, and most of us, I think, haven't had that because the adults who raised us didn't learn that. So I really need to start with what I call our good grief beliefs, which are all those ways that we view grief that are not helpful. And so when parents work with me, they really are blazing a new trail. They're going in a direction that they wouldn't have gone probably on their own oh, wow. because they learned, you know, don't, don't share your feelings. Don't upset your child. Don't upset someone else. My mom was so uncomfortable with my son's loss that when I went to visit her after he died, instead of staying up to talk with me that night after my daughter was asleep, she said, I'm going to bed. And she left me out there by myself. And she had not said a word to me about my son having died, her grandson, because it was just so hard for her. Oh, so we I are, feel bad for her and for you. And yes. just the pain, you know, yes. so, so you mentioned, and this must be an example of it, like what not to do, but what did you call it? Good grief, something good grief parent. Oh, well, good grief beliefs are where yeah. I start. You okay. know, it's, it's interesting, Judy, your recent episode was about anger and how we think of anger as a bad thing. That's the way we think of grief too. 
Mm -hmm. think of grief as something to avoid and to not touch with a 10 foot pole. If we know someone who's grieving, we are, we're really wary of talking to them. Many grievers find themselves kind of abandoned as I was by my mother, by people who just don't know what to say or how to talk about it, because we think that facing grief is just too painful and we don't want to be responsible for that pain. But I, what I learned was that grief is, uh, is necessary, just just like anger is, we get angry, as you pointed out, for a reason. And it's not a bad thing to be angry. We just need to know how to cope with it well. And it's the same thing with grief. Grief is the way that we heal. People who don't allow themselves to grieve and mourn when they've lost a child or a loved one are, are really not going to heal in the same way. I've unfortunately met adults not who say I wish you were there when when my sibling died when I was a child because my parents were so broken and they never got over it and we never talked about it and I never got my needs met what I help parents do is provide a good grief experience for themselves and for their children Children. by helping them know how to face grief in healthy and helpful ways I think that's amazing. And I'm just thinking back on some of the experiences I had and in, in, in particular, someone who was very close to me who lost a child and the family was, I was very close to the family. And I remember her mother, who was an astounding, is an astounding woman, said, you know, people are afraid to talk to us about so-and-so's death. And she said, I don't know why they're afraid to mention it. It's on our mind all the time anyway. And so I re I learned that at that moment, I'm like, just talk about it with them. Just tell them and bring it up and, and do things. But it's, it's hard because it's awkward for those of us who have not had that loss and we care about our friends, but we don't know what to say or our sister or whoever it is, or, you know, Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we think we want to fix it. You know, first of all, society kind of teaches us, you know, don't upset the upset them. That's what we think is that we don't want to bring it up. But like you say, the griever is thinking of it all the time, you are not going to remind them of something that they're not thinking about. Um, If they, if they cry, when you talk to them, you didn't make them cry, they, they cry when you're not there too. It's, but the best thing you can give a griever is just that recognition that they're dealing with something just incredibly unfathomable and painful and that you can't fix it. You don't even try. There's not no right thing that you can say. So just say, I'm thinking of you. I'm here for you. Uh, Check in with them once in a while. Mm -hmm. I used to have people see me at church or wherever and say, you know, I've been thinking of you, but I didn't want to call you and bother you. And I was thinking, oh, I would have loved to have had someone call me and say, I'm thinking of you. Mm. Maybe I wanted to talk and then they were there. And if I didn't want to talk, I didn't have to answer the phone, but they could leave me a voicemail that would have warmed my heart knowing that someone just was thinking of me. So that's really all that you can do, but it is so much. And the other thing is to share memories of the person who died. That is so precious to the griever. People would say, oh, you know, I remember when David was a greeter at church and he was so serious and so cute in his little plaid shirt with a button down collar. And, you know, I love (laughs) when they share those stories and might it make me teary? Yes, but I love, I love that they remember him. So this is just opening up and bringing that loss into the light of day. And that is just really such a comfort to a griever. It's I, that's so interesting. You know, if you bring it out there mm-hmm. and a little bit of the awkwardness, I think goes away, especially knowing that the person who's trying to comfort their friend or whatever, they're not expected to fix it. They're just right. expected to Remember, and I, I, one of the things that sticks in my mind when you said is just to keep the memory alive of Mm -hmm. the loved one. Mm -hmm. So 
this audience is may not there and there may be some parents of young children but by and large most of this audience have children who are a little bit older but i think it mm-hmm. doesn't matter at what age you know right. if you lose a young person whether they're a young adult or a youngster mm-hmm. doesn't matter but what about like i'm coming from my position here how could i support how could someone who's maybe you know, a woman who's maybe an empty nester or a midlifer or somewhere along, how could she support either if it's, God forbid, a grandchild or a niece or a nephew or a close friend's Mm -hmm. child, Mm -hmm. how could they support the surviving sibling and the whole family? Really, there are there are a few things that I recommend, um, and they are kind of geared to young children, but equally helpful to older children. First of all, um, to really model the idea of self care for the parent. If you are not the parent, um, if you are a support to a parent really encourage that parent to take care of themselves and recognize that um, while they care about their child, they can't really care for their child as well um, if they're not taking care of themselves. So you can be that support person that encourages them and facilitates even them taking care of themselves because the parent really does need to do that so that they're the best they can be for their child. And also just so they're being a good role model because kids need to see adults taking care of themselves when they're grieving. And so you can be that support person that facilitates that. And then the other thing is being honest with children and allowing conversations because too often a a really painful loss of a, of a person we love becomes this elephant in the room that people don't talk about because they're afraid they're going to break down or whatever they may be afraid of. They, or they learned that, um, you know, that you don't talk about it and they're kind of afraid to, because they're afraid they're going to lose it. What we know from supporting grievers is that really the opposite is true. If you bring, if you talk about your loss, if you're able to share it, it is healing and it, it, uh, yes, it's painful, but it's going to be painful either way. And there is a release and there is a healing that happens when you talk about it. So we really need to give that gift to children as well. Um, with young children, I tell parents to be honest and, and to use, you know, with young children, I say, use is use the word dead, died. Um, and then the child may not understand the full meaning of that word, but they will grow into it. And you are giving them the one word that accurately, uh, describes what happened to the loved one, their body stopped working. With an older child, it's, it's a matter of, you know, acknowledging how hard it is that this person is gone, being able to share uh, memories about um, missing them and having conversations with I really miss your brother when, you know, when we do this, I miss that he's no longer there. What do you miss? keeping conversation oh. open. Kids may and young people may not want to talk. And that's okay. You're mm-hmm. still giving them permission to um, talk when they want to. And that is just so important. So those are those are just really a couple of keys is just, um, you know, encouraging each person involved to take care of their grief, however they need to. And we spend a lot of time looking at the different ways that that may be, because it's different for each person. Mm -hmm. And then just making sure that you're leaving space for, for conversation. Oh, I like that space for conversation. That feels more, I don't know, like doable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And if the person doesn't speak, you know, we don't, you don't, we so often when we're trying to support someone worry about um, 
how it's going to affect them. And we are not, we can't heal them. We can just be there for them. So really that if I can impress that on your listeners, that is just so key. Yeah. To just be there. Just be there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my goodness. Your, um, your little boy, I was reading on your website, sounded like he was very, very in tune spiritually. Yes. More than, more than, as I was reading, I'm thinking this is like more than what his age would indicate he might be capable of. And yes. how did you, um, how did you respond to that? Oh, Judy, that was such a gift because I'm a person of faith mm -hmm. and I, and I learned so much in my journey with him. I was really taken to a new level and uh, there were um, times when he was such a teacher to me because he had an understanding that I wasn't, I wasn't sure where it came from. And, um, but it was a gift to me and it's part of what's enabled me to do what I'm doing now because I, uh, I was able to survive this, this loss, seeing a greater picture, understanding um, what my son's experience was from that spiritual perspective and therefore what mine was and what my daughter's was and their dad. And um, it was really a gift because this is such a devastating experience to have. And I personally being a person of faith, I cannot imagine having had this experience without the encouragement that came from recognizing the, the greater, um, the greater spirit at work in our experience and the, and that my son was prepared for what happened to him. And, um, you know, children don't understand death the way that we do. So in that respect, they aren't devastated by it the way that we are. Oh. He knew that he wasn't going to be with us anymore. And his thing was that he was going to miss us, but he was prepared to go to Jesus and go where he was going to go. And, um, and that was a comfort to me. So it was uh, really quite an amazing experience. And, you know, the other thing I will say is that when I talk to uh, the healthcare workers at Children's Hospital where he was, this, um, this recognition of some of these kids who are terminally ill and uh, who do end up dying, being sort of wise beyond their years is not an uncommon experience. They, these kids that go through this kind of uh, illness and have these experiences, I, what the healthcare workers said to me is that it's not uncommon to see them seem kind of so wise beyond their years and sort of have this kind of peace with their situation yeah. that we as adults don't have. So it's really pretty amazing. It, it, when I read your story, and correct me if I got this wrong, but I read you giving an account of him talking about, he was speaking to someone. Was he talking yes. in his sleep? Yes. Yes. He used to have night terrors when he was little and, um, and be, you know, really disturbed at, at night. This is common with kids his age. Mm -hmm. And, um, when he was sick, you know, he still had those at times. And there was one night, um, and this was after his cancer had returned his cancer. Uh, we fought it for a year and it went away and it was gone. And, mm. you know, the tumor was completely gone and they did surgery and the, uh, the prognosis was good, but really very quickly within a couple of months, his cancer was back with a vengeance and it was in his bone marrow and, um, and that for his cancer, this was really, you know, a, a poor outlook from then on. And it was um, at that point that he, I woke up one night, we had both of our children in the same room with a monitor on and I heard him saying, 
I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then he listened for a while and he said, all right, I'll come. And so I, I mean, clearly he was talking to someone. It was mm -hmm. not his typical night terror. Mm -hmm. And um, we went in there after the conversation stopped and we sort of, you know, uh, saw that he was okay, sort of tended to him. The next morning when he got up, we kind of wanted to, you know, feel out what he remembered. And all he remembered was that we had come in there to comfort him. He didn't remember a conversation with anyone, but he was, he was just at peace. He was just upbeat. He was a different child. He was um, just really, uh, really at peace. And um, it, that he he did end up dying after that. And we just felt that he had gotten this visit from an angel or someone indicating, mm -hmm. you know, what was going to happen to him. And for me, as the parent hearing this, and my, my husband heard it too, I woke him up and he heard it too. It wasn't just me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't quite know what to think of it. I desperately didn't want to believe what I thought it meant. But at the same time, I could, you know, I could see that there was such a difference in him, in him. and, um, and it was, it was comforting. So yes, that was pretty amazing. And he never had any more night terrors after that. He slept just, you know, no more of his fitful sleeping, which had really been pretty characteristic of his sleep up to that point. After that, he just slept soundly um, unless he was, you know, later on when he was hurting and would have to get up or we'd have to go help him or something. But mm -hmm. yeah. Oh my goodness. That just gives me the chills. Yes. You know, um, whatever anyone's faith or whatever, I mean, I don't know. Right. You cannot deny a higher power at that point. No, no, it, it certainly was. Um, yeah, it certainly was an experience that um, was a tip. You know, I, there was really only one way I felt I could interpret that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So did your daughter wake up during that or did she ever make a comment about that? No, no, she didn't. In fact, it is so interesting um, my daughter was such a, an even keel through the whole thing. The other thing, the other story that I share about her was the very first night she was 15 months old when her brother was diagnosed. And the very first night that he went to the hospital, uh, with his dad, and stayed overnight, she and I were home and, and I wasn't this distraught mess. You know, we of course had had this experience in our family, but I myself that night was okay. But she wandered upstairs and downstairs and to the garage and to David's bed. And she was just wailing. She was making a sound that was inhuman. It was alarming to me. She was mm. just in such distress. And I would go to her and try to comfort her. And she'd push me away and throw herself on the floor. So this was really the early experience we had with her. And I thought, okay, when we are all at the hospital, she is coming with us. She's not going to be with a neighbor knowing her whole family's gone. So through those whole, uh, for those two and a half years, she would go to the hospital with us. Our son was in a children's hospital. They had, you know, provision for siblings. This mm -hmm. was 20 years ago and she was able to spend a lot of time in his room with him. They were able to develop this, you know, deep friendship and sibling bond. And it was very good for her. She understood what was happening to her brother. She was even keel. She was his comfort when he needed it. Um, in fact, I, I have, and she went through her twos and threes. She toilet trained herself completely. She was never this terrible two or terrible three. She was just so uh, never wanted to rock the boat. In fact, we would talk to her sometimes and say, Deanna, honey, it's okay for you to be mad. It's okay for you to be upset because she just never was. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, you asked. She didn't about know her. any different, right? Well, and she just, it was just her nature to just not rock the boat. She knew that there was all this turmoil going on and, and she just was, you know, going to not contribute to it. And I have pictures of uh, the last night that my son was alive. I was holding him and rocking him in their bedroom. And um, my, you know, we knew that he was dying very soon. And he ended up dying that night after, you know, I said to my husband, we would got to get him into our bed. And he had was hooked up to all of his paraphernalia. And Michael said, okay, and he went and got our bed ready to take David in there. Mm. And David had been sort of in a coma for a couple of days, he had been in so much pain that we had raised his uh, pain medication to just sedate him. Mm -hmm. So he hadn't been responsive. But when I said to his dad, we have to, you know, get him into our bed, David smiled at me. Oh. And so we took him in our bed and that's where he died. But my husband has pictures of me holding my son in the rocking chair in the bedroom with my daughter and I'm crying and Deanna is soundly sleeping in her bed right beside me. So, you know, she had been through so much uh, of the, you know, the upheaval. And like you say, she didn't really know any differently. This was her life. Mm -hmm. And she was just this even keel through the whole thing. So wow. that was, that was uh, pretty, pretty interesting. You know, one of the things I help parents and adults understand is the different ways that that children will deal with this kind of experience, because this is the child who said to me, mommy, half of me is gone. But yet after her brother died, had she not said those words to me, I didn't see she didn't grieve the way I did. I'd cry fairly often. And she mm -hmm. and I would talk about being sad. And um, one time I was crying and um, she came in and and I said, oh, I'm just so sad that that David's not here. And of course, we talked about David being here, mm -hmm. you know, being still being with us. And I said, I mean, that he's not physically here to hug me anymore. And she looked at me and she said, oh, mommy, he still hugs me. And so, oh. yeah, so she said, he still hugs me. And she, they used to play ninjas and, and she had her ninja-ness. She would say, I've got my ninja-ness and she would be able, you know, she was felt that she was interacting with him through her ninja-ness. And this lasted maybe for a couple of years or so. And then uh, at one point she told me she had lost her ninja-ness and she couldn't, she couldn't talk to David anymore. So, but oh. this was her sibling experience and, um, and yet, and she had told me half of her was gone. And I knew the truth of that for a young child and their identity development. She was his little sister her whole life. And with him gone, who was she? And this very yeah. vital part of her was torn away. But I didn't see her grieving. I didn't hear her crying. I wouldn't have noticed that uh, you know, I wouldn't have known the depth of her grief without those words. So that's one of the big things I caution adults about is that your child may not appear to be grieving, but I guarantee you that they are. They grieve a lot through their play. Um, you know, they're not going to cry necessarily the way that we do. And they may behave in uncharacteristic ways. My daughter was as good as gold other kids might be, um, you know, more irritable or more clingy or might do some other behaviors that are, um, you know, that we kind of sometimes think they're misbehaving, they're grieving in the only way they know how to process that emotion, which is not the way that we do. Mm -hmm. So that's important for adults to realize. And that's why that keeping the conversation open is so important because you're not going to necessarily see that the child needs or wants to talk. So you need to make sure you're making that available for them.
all the more important, mm-hmm. right? To not make it the elephant in the room and get right. it out in the open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What a lesson that, mm-hmm. you know, these little kids, there's in many ways so much more intuitive than. Yes. And maybe they're uninhibited. Like I feel like maybe life experience for us being older and even for your mom who didn't know what to do or say, yes. you know, is just maybe been affected by life experiences yes. and how they think they they should behave versus how they actually feel. Very much so. And that's why I, you know, our tendency is to protect children when they've experienced loss and grief. And I say childhood is the best time to learn about grief because they are open. They will receive it. We do learn then for better or for worse, how we're going to live our lives experiencing loss and grief. And those of us in adulthood who um, had adults who didn't know how to be about uh, be open about it, uh, have ourselves become adults who don't know how to be open about it. So I really want to help parents um, teach their kids how to be open and those kids will grow up to pass that on through their families and hopefully our whole society will become better at doing grief and supporting one another when we're grieving. Yeah, because the fact of the matter is at some point in our life, we will have grief. Yes, it's a fact of human existence. Yes. And most of us have our first loss in childhood, not always the death of a of a loved one, but you know, it might be the death of a pet or, or it might be divorce and loss of the familiar family. Mm, Good point. Yeah. Your favorite bedroom and losing. I remember when I lost my best friend as a child and how hard that was for me to have that loss. So um, those are all opportunities for adults to help children learn how to recognize that it makes sense that this feels so bad to you, but we can live forward through it and we can learn to be resilient and life goes on and there are more, more good things ahead, no matter how hard that loss is. And you mentioned something especially relevant, I think, to this of keeping the memories of the the loved one, the deceased alive and to keep talking about it and bringing it up. And I love that. I love Mm -hmm. when I just think about, um, and gosh, now I haven't even thought about this in a while. It's coming back to me that I actually lost a cousin when I was a a young adolescent. Oh yes. And we knew that he would pass too, but we didn't know when. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you know, there was, one telephone in the house. And when the phone mm-hmm. rang, I remember that Sunday morning, I, I woke up early because I was that kid who always woke up early and, and <laughs> ran to get the phone. And I remember my uncle being on the phone and he said, Judy, get your dad on the phone. And I was like, okay. You know, and mm-hmm. I will say, I, my parents, we talked about the loss of, of, my cousin, Mark, we talked about it and talked wow. about it and talked mm-hmm. about it. And I, I think mm-hmm. back now, um, wow. Thanks mom and dad. I, mm-hmm. I hadn't thought Absolutely. about that till just now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Things would be different and we don't realize, you know, I think as adults, we can look back because we don't realize the difference that makes for us to either have these conversations or not have these conversations. It's just the way it was done at the time. But when we get to be adults and we look at, um, you know, how we're doing it going forward, you can you can go back and trace those roots to, you know, your earlier experiences, experiences. that you had. So that that is not to be taken lightly. It's just such a a huge thing to keep that conversation open. And, you know, um, early in the 1900s, it was Sigmund Freud, who was one of the first pioneers in, in grief. And his idea of what grief was is that it's when you um, get over a relationship and move forward. Now, that sounds familiar to every single one of us who's ever lost someone because it is still the advice that some people feel like they should give us. But thankfully, 
you know, as grievers, we just instinctively know that we don't want to leave this loved one behind. We don't want to get over it, but yet no. people kind of imply that if you can't get past it and move on, you're not healing. Now we know better. We know that we yeah. can do both. We can keep those memories alive. That's a huge part of healing. It's a huge part of healing for children who have lost you know, their dad or their mom or their sibling or a beloved grandparent, or even a dog that, you know, was part of their life for a number of years Yeah, to be able to remember that in happy ways and to speak the name and to hold the memories and to maybe even, you know, we still have French silk pie for David's birthday because he loved French silk pie. Oh. And, um, you know, that was one of the last things he was able to eat when he was really sick. And so we have French silk pie on his birthday. Um, we've been doing it for 20 years and we'll continue to do it. And, you know, these continuing bonds is a newer a view of grief and how to go through grief is to continue that bond. And it is such a healthy way. So you're right. That is just such a good thing for grievers and people who want to support grievers. Yeah. No. Yeah. How, how many of you right now listening are thinking about someone that you loved and lost in their favorite birthday pie? I know I'm thinking about pineapple upside down cake. Cause that was my oh, dad's favorite. Yes. <laughs> yes. And aren't those wonderful memories and it just, it ties the senses together, mm -hmm. you know, and there are tastes and smells and touches and those things that remind us of our loved one. And they are all so precious. Yes, they are. And precious. doesn't it make you smile? I mean, you're smiling, Judy. You I know, am doesn't smiling. Doesn't it make us yeah. smile when we think about it? I smile when I think of David and his French silk pie. And so, yes, these, this is just uh, such a healing um, healing thing is to just remember and have those memories. Mm -hmm. That is just so sweet. And I don't mean that as a pun, but actually it could be. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Yeah. So where can people get a hold of you and you can say it and then I'll pop it in the show notes. Yes. Uh, you can find me at my website, goodgriefparenting.com. I have a good grief guide that you can download there that is just really helpful for any adult who wants to know some keys to help a young person who is grieving. If you wonder how to help them get my good grief guide. And I also am on Instagram. It's all at good grief parenting, good grief parenting on Instagram, goodgriefparenting.com is my website. So please visit me there. And, um, Yes. And you can reach out to me through those two places as well to have a conversation. That's mm -hmm. fabulous. Thank you. And now I know that it's certainly okay that we could have laughter during this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I feel better yes. about it. At yes. the beginning, when we first got on, I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm going to be allowed to laugh today. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, a child would laugh. We can. Yes. Yeah. The whole point is to live forward. I, I help families live forward toward a future bright with possibilities and even joy, grief and joy, grief and laughter, grief and happiness. All of those things can coexist. So I love that. it is okay permission and taking it from someone who's really walked in those shoes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here. I just want to say thank you. And folks, just take a look at the show notes. If you'd like to reach out, or if you know someone who might maybe want to just uh, take a little visit over to the website and learn about good grief parenting. And it's not just for parents, right? It could be for Again, if you have friends or just mm -hmm. someone that you know who mm -hmm. has had the loss of a child and if you have anything to do with them and really anyone in their family, right? Yes, yes. And I work with child care provider, providers. I do trainings for them. Really any adult who is going to be in a position to help a young child through grief. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. What an amazing... I mean, I'm sad because... 
of the way that this came about for you to find your calling, but I feel like it's a blessing that you are able to provide this for people. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Judy. I, I hope I know that it is for those people who need me. I'm here. Thank you so much for letting me uh, have an opportunity to speak to your audience, your big air hug, air hug community. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 And Thank you. You are so very welcome. Wow. I don't even know what to say, except that I'm sure that if you are listening today and you're still listening, that you have probably been in that situation of feeling awkward and not knowing how to comfort someone who has gone through the loss, specifically the loss of a child, whether it be their own child or someone they're very close to, you know, maybe it's a grandchild. I don't know, but it's it's sticky, it's awkward, it's messy. And as much as we want to comfort that person, we just feel like we don't know what to do. And Michelle just pulled out all the stops and, and unfortunately she had to go through this herself. But as she says, she felt that this is what she's supposed to be doing in her life. And she does so well with helping people with this. And so I would like to say, if you are listening today, um, please share this because grief touches us all. And there's so much that we can learn from this. In fact, we can have joy and grieve at the same time. There's no wrong way to grieve. The griever knows how to grieve. We don't need to tell the griever what they should or shouldn't be doing. It's not for us to experience, or maybe we are the griever. Um, I mean, I don't know what you're going through, but I just felt in my heart that this was a topic that needed to be talked about. And, and you know on the Air Hug community, we're always here to share stories that happen in real life and, and how people grow from them and what they can do from them. And so thank you very much for listening. If this touched you and you have not left a review yet, please leave a review either on Spotify or Apple. And also share this information with someone that you know might benefit from it. And I'm certain that every single one of you out there listening knows at least one person who could benefit from this conversation. So thank you and ta-ta for now. If you have a story that you want to be told or you know a story that touched your heart in a very special way, please reach out to me and we would be happy to get that person here on the Air Hug community to share their story so that, so that others may grow from their experience. Ta-ta for now.